Yes, okay, let's start. <laughs> My name is Michael Case, and I work with Kira Consulting. Um, we are a, a smallish consulting group, about 10 people scattered around the world, uh, working on interesting problems, usually in, uh, usually in C++, but they can range all over the place. I, I notice in the crowd are um, some of my hardware friends. So those of you that are that I've met that I know are already double E's, and then probably the rest of you are like closet double E's um, to, to show up here. What, what we're gonna talk about is um, an MQTT library. And um, MQTT is used in a lot of different places as a messaging protocol. Um, the, of recent years, it's become very, um, very popular because um, all these Internet of Things things need to talk, and um, it's a pretty lightweight protocol, lightweight. And um, it used to mean um, telemetry transport, and that got dropped long ago. It is an ISO standard. Um, it is a publisher subscriber model, and um, it requires a reliable connection. So that's one of the, the attributes of this. It assumes that there is a reliable connection. Now, some people will go on and state that it requires a TCP connection. The reality is, is the spec doesn't say that. It just says reliable. Um, and we'll see. Well, we probably won't see too much, but we'll, we'll try to see in a moment. So let's take a look here at um, this I the idea of what um, MQTT is. Uh, in this diagram, we have the broker in the center. And the broker is like the server side that is going to take care of the requests of a variety of clients that connect in and route messages around. Um, so there's a lot of different ways you could implement a publisher subscriber type model. The subscribers could go to a directory and in essence get in connection direct, directly with another subscriber of data, I'm sorry, a publisher of data and they'd be connected directly. That would be one way, right? Um, but this, this is like a, a fairly common way. Everybody goes to one central location and then in this case, the broker, as it's called, is gonna take care of the route, routing of data. Um, the broker has a lot of different jobs it will keep track of, as a client connects, whether or not it has what's called a last will, so messages that should be sent out if the client disconnects. It will keep track of things such as um, sessions, kind of, concept of almost like a session. So as you connect again, if there were messages that were for you but you weren't connected previously, it will go ahead and relay those back. You can clear your sessions out. Um, so the broker has a few different jobs. Um, clients around the outside then connect and um, there is actually somewhat of a, um, it's not just subscribing and, and publishing strings for topics, you, there's actually a format to them, such that you could subscribe and with slashes, those are different levels of indicators that you're subscribing to. So here the nuke plant power is subscribing to town plant plus power control. The plus is a wild card and it says, Anything at all that goes inside that section, please send me. So this is going to match um, anything that is to the town and power plant, regardless of what the next section is, and has a power control. Those topics it will receive. And when you're subscribing, that's called um, a, a filter. So you're providing the filter of what you want to subscribe for, what type of topics. Um, the toaster is uh, subscribing to town plant toaster hash, and hash is another special wild card um, for most brokers. That wild card means anything that follows afterward. And so it could have multiple levels, it doesn't really matter. It's like subscribing, if you think about these as trees, at one node in the tree and then everything that's below that. Um, and then on the publish side, you publish a, a specific topic. So the switch is publishing town plant toaster power control with a value or a payload of on. And that should go um, to the toaster because it's getting everything. And actually the, the nuclear power plant is also going to receive it and it's going to shut down. Oh no, it's going to turn on. It's going to turn on at the same time the toaster does um, because they weren't real selective about what they were doing. So this is the basic idea of MQTT. Um, the, the nice thing about it um, is that there are really few messages that you have to concern yourself with. Uh, so the, the basic ones, are just getting going and, and not doing anything fancy, you gotta be able to connect and disconnect, um, subscribe and unsubscribe to things, publish, and then you have to respond to pings. There's a keep alive with the server. The server is going to expect that on occasion you send it something. 
anything. And if it hasn't received a message from you for a certain period of time, you have to ping it and let it know that you're still alive. It supports three levels of um, quality of service. So QoS zero basically means that you're going to publish messages and you're not going to care about them. Um, and you're going to possibly receive messages and you may or may not get them. The broker is going to just send them out. So the QoS level is at most once delivery. That's QoS zero. Uh, at most, you're going to receive the message one time. QoS level one is at least once delivery. So there's some acknowledgement in this process that you're going to get a message. So you get a message, and if you don't acknowledge it, it's going to send you another message. And if you don't acknowledge it, it's going to send you another message after some period of time. So there might be several messages in flight. So you're going to receive at least one of those. And in the process, there's a special bit inside of the MQTT protocol that tells you that it's a duplicate. So you're going, the first time you get it, you know it's the first time. And then after that, there's a dupe bit that's marked and you kind of know, oh, well, I might have already received this one. Um, yes? So yeah, so there, it's not necessarily a sequence number. There is an ID number, a packet ID number. And so you will have the packet ID number and you'll also have then the dupe bit that goes with it that tells you this is a duplicate. But the handshake is simply an acknowledgement handshake back to the server saying, yes, I received this particular packet. And it's, it's for that message, right? So it's going to rebroadcast that same message with the same packet ID if it doesn't receive an ACK against it. Um, exactly once delivery, then is going to have this multiple acknowledgement that goes so that there's this handshake back and forth. Yep, I received it. Did you receive it? Yep, I received it. Oh, I received it. Okay, so now everybody's happy that you received it and you'll only receive it one time. Any guaranteed ordering of messages? It, not that I know of. That's a good question. Um, so I've not dealt with the broker side uh, and writing a broker side. I'm only as a user of a broker. And as far as I know, there's, there is no guarantee. In a month, I'll let you know. Okay. This is really cool. I'm gonna do it. This is really cool. All right. <laughs> in the, uh, at least once delivered, the dupes, uh, is this in addition to the underlying reliable transport players? Uh, yes, yeah, so this is all things that are built on top. This is just talking about the messaging protocol itself. So the question was, do, um, is this in addition to the reliability of the communication protocol? Yes, it is. So um, the, the protocol itself has its own dupe. If it's TCP, whatever else they're dealing with, you, it, you're not in that packet layer at all, right? Okay, so you know, that's actually a really good question, we'll, and um, we'll just touch on it now. What does it mean to acknowledge the rec receipt of a message? So um, let, let's just like say you're a light bulb. Okay, and you're hanging out. Um, is it the fact that the light bulb received the message to turn off and has turned off at the application layer that, that the message was received? Or is it the acknowledgement that it was received at like the protocol layer? And really the proper way to implement MQTT client behaviors, and we're gonna see this kind of a problem with existing libraries that are out there, is it's an application layer thing. You're saying, hey, my app got it, right? And that, depending upon the embedded device you're working in or the type of um, thing you're doing, that's a very different answer than the protocol layer got it and acknowledged it. Um, so, yeah, so that's a great question. That's a possibility, yeah. It's, and also with these, these low power things that wake up and go to sleep, um, the layers that are doing the communicating aren't always the layers that are doing the work. And so that passing, passing the data into the application, the application may never have actually gotten it. Um, it actually, it, it simplifies a lot. So if you think about the reliability not being at the protocol layer and being at the application layer where you would do the acknowledgement, then it's like the hard work, so-called so hard work is in the broker. It just has to keep retransmitting it until the, the application has acknowledged that it's done something with the message, right? That actually simplifies the code out of those other layers, if you take advantage of it. Um, all right, so uh, MQTT is being used both in large and small systems. So if you've used RabbitMQ, a lot of people have heard of it or have used it in different applications. RabbitMQ uses other messaging queue type technologies too, but it does also support MQTT. Um, Amazon IoT platform is MQTT based. Uh, light bulb toasters, coffee makers, just kind of like everything that's kind
coming together seems to be it. Medical equipment, sensors, phone applications, um, all kind of all over. Um, so uh, before we get there, uh, yeah, no, let's do that. Let's do that now. What is embedded? What is embedded? I mean, this talk is on MQTT in an embedded platform, whatever that is. Okay, Sergey, thanks. Uh, limitation of resources would be an indicator of maybe an embedded environment. I can tell you Jeff, what, it's not. what is it not, Jeff? It's not the server farm that the broker is All right, Jeff says it's not the server farm that the broker is running. All right, any other thoughts? I would say it's like computers which you don't recognize. Okay, computers that you don't recognize as being computers. Good. Usually it's like running a risk architecture. All right. Jackie is very specific. It's going to be running a risk architecture, in fact. <laughs> Single purpose application running on basically no Okay, so single purpose, embedded OS, maybe no OS. Right. All right, no OS. So, yep. Threat. Boris? It's something that actually, you know, the computer is going to know the thing. There's something else that it's computer is serving. Okay, so computer's not necessarily the thing. It's, it's um, helping that along, whatever it is that's working on. All right. Uh, I any other thoughts? What, what, what an embedded device might be? I'll put you on the spot as you walk in. Oh, what is embedded? Hmm. I don't have a good answer to that. Yeah, so I, I think that's a good answer. It's kind of given in the context of, of lighter computing power, but that's not really true when you think about aircraft systems, right? Because that, they're embedded. So. Right, yeah, aircraft systems are considered embedded. So I, I think uh, 25 years ago, I was able to answer this question that's up on the board fairly easily, or at least I felt like I could answer it real easily. Um, and I. Um, I think I struggle with it a lot now when somebody asks me what embedded means simply because uh, it, it still maybe means something different to me than it does to other people. Uh, what was your name? Alex. Alex. Okay, Alex, um, Alex kind of hit what is a common answer these days, which is um, it's, it's not recognizable as a computer. So an embedded device has usually some purpose that it's performing for you. There's compute power and such in it, but you don't recognize it as a computer itself. So, you know, we, we, um, we now talk about these things as being embedded devices, right? Um, which to me is just kind of ludicrous because the amount of power that is on something like this. Um, I actually don't even know how many processors is in this thing. Somebody else probably could tell me, I don't know. Uh, more, lots, I don't know what it is, right? And there's a graphics something with a graphics processor. And, this, uh, this is a, a device that I use for a client in um, a medical device that we're working on right now. And it has um, all of 4K of RAM on it. And um, the processor is their own design, right? It doesn't do a lot of much of anything. Um, and, uh, but it does what we need. And, uh, Very low power, I assume. It, it is fairly low power, but we only need it to last for about two hours to make it through the operation. We just need it to sit on the shelf life for a long time, right, beyond that. Um, it's got like an accelerometer in it so that we can figure some other information out and some other crud, right? But to, to me, this is like, this is an embedded device, right? That's definitely an embedded device. And I think that some of the struggle that we have with them, what does it mean to be embedded is just the fact that it, it kind of ch has changed a lot. So as a result, um, it should have also changed our idea of what we can do with an embedded device when we write software. And that we're gonna to try to get to in this presentation a little bit. Um, so answering what an embedded device is is like super hard, I think, um, because this is, oops, oops, this is like C++ on an embedded device. What, are you crazy? You can't do that. So Jeff had this great idea. I was trying to think, what are all the reasons that people say you can't actually put C++ on an embedded device. He's like, why don't you just go ask Twitter? So um, before I got a chance to ask Twitter, we, um, I, if, if somebody in the company posted this. I mean, in fact, maybe it was Jeff that you sent the link. Um, it's like, this is the code to set a vector to a constant size initialized to zero. Now, it just looks scary, more so than anything else, right? I mean, wh what, 
what is it really? I don't know, because I actually tried to get Clang to produce the same thing, and I couldn't get it to produce it. I actually couldn't get it to produce anything, so that's probably a different problem. Um, so I asked, what, um, that's the final call graphs. Uh, what top four reasons you have or have heard of for not using C++ in an embedded device, right? And unfortunately, I only got two back. More complicated regulatory approval, smaller developer pool, bloated binaries. Okay, that's all I recall right now. Um, I, I've heard all of those, uh, especially the regulatory one. People get really concerned about that, which is kind of funny to me that as if you could prove a C code thing working, you know, I, it, it's just weird. Yep, that is, that's exactly right. Yep, so the history of what is certified um, is very important in certification process. I've worked both with FDA and FAA uh, regulations. That's important. Um, oh, uh, smaller developer pool, yeah, which is why we run these conferences. We're trying to get the developer pool to be better, right? I, I don't like that excuse. I, I mean, I'd rather work with a different pool. Maybe that's what it is. And then bloated binaries. Um, I'm kind of tired of hearing about bloated binaries. Bloated binaries are typically an indicator that you're doing something wrong, not necessarily the language. Um, okay, CS programmers going wild by creating too, minil, too many levels of abstractions, templates, and causing Mars Climate Observer to crash. All right. Go, yeah, Jeff. Yeah, if they had boost units, it wouldn't have crashed, and there would have been no bloat involved at all with boost units, right? I mean, it just falls away in, compila in compilation. Um, which is funny, because that would have been an, a level of abstraction that would have helped. Mr. Boost Units author is even in here. Wouldn't have, now, it would have helped, right? Yes, he says yes. <laughs> okay. Um, so there's a lot of lore around this. And um, let's just, we're going to get some popcorn for a moment. Um, hopefully this will work. And this is, a, this is an embedded device. This is actually many embedded devices working together using C++. This is a, kind of an oldish video. Uh, this is a machine that worked on that is sorting glass. And um, this is one of the initial runs that we were doing. We're trying to figure out, is it gonna even work? <laughs> it's that first one you usually try to run. The idea is that it actually sorts glass in three sections and the trash falls down. The reason there's a video of this at all is because it wasn't working, right? So it's not doing a great job of it. Um, but the end result of the project is it sorted seven and a half tons of glass per hour. I'm sorry, uh, seven and a half tons of trash an hour. Um, by having this conveyor belt run and things fall off the end. We'll talk a little bit more about this in a minute. Um, so the, uh, apparently that worked okay, right? I think C++ didn't totally screw that one up. Um, it is, um, these are the rows of, of air jets. And there's three sets of air jets. This is basically the coming off the end of the conveyor belt. There's a light bar, there's a line scan camera up at the top that's looking down at this. Um, and these about 900 air jets. Um, it's controlling all the control bits, the image processing, the firing of the air jets. It's five milliseconds from the time that a piece of trash leaves to the time that we've got to program exactly what's gonna to happen to the first row of the manifold. Um, so within that five milliseconds, we've got to start making determinations of, is this really glass? Is it the right color of glass? <laughs> um, there's a lot of decisions being made. Uh, now, it's hard real time in the sense that if you miss the window, you don't, you don't get the glass. That's actually, actually a big problem because you've got to capture more than 99% of it to make it profitable. So you've got to capture, capture all the glass. Um, but it's not hard real time in the sense of something bad is going to happen you know, if you miss the window. If you miss the window, okay, you didn't get some glass. Um, this is, uh, this one's running, oh, and that, this was running actually an operating system of some sort. Linux, it happened to be, um, and modified slightly, but uh, this one's running four cold fire processors. It has um, no operating system. They have just 32K of RAM um, and 256 of flash. 
Um, these processors are sitting inside of that tube collecting EM data as it bounces back out from the earth to understand what it looks like underneath the ground. Um, that's all very, um, has to take care of a bunch of jitter problems and things that are going on, right? And, um, you know, that was all written inside C++. It seemed like it probably worked okay. Uh, this one's got five cold fire processors of similar type thing. They're communicating, doing some weather stuff for visibility sensors. This one is um, running one cold fire um, processor. And it is, uh, it's also, this one has no OS. And it's sending a laser up and then looking at the scatter coming back to determine base, base and depth of clouds. Um, and again, this is kind of, you know, a typical type embedded thing. Also got some pretty tight timing you know, situations here. These are all the types of things that people typically will say you can't do with C++. C++ is just not a good candidate for these types of problems. Iridium satellites, block one, 1998, Motorola 68,000 processor. Awesome. An Amiga computer. All right, so an Amiga computer is inside the Iridium. <laughs> On C++. Nice, I didn't know that. Did you know you can't do that? <laughs> you know you can't. <laughs> good job. Um, okay, so one question is why another library? There are a few MQTT libraries out there. I won't mention their names, um, but they are sponsored by very big organizations, some of them. Um, and uh, the reason I'm in the situation of talking about MQTT libraries is because I got to write an MQTT library in December for a project for a client. Uh, we were actually expecting to use one of these other libraries. That was how the project began but it was lacking in a lot of places and we just couldn't do that. Um, one of which is this type of thing. So this is um, a message sequence chart, not to be confused with a sequence diagram. So the user is sending out a sub subscribe message or would like to subscribe and sends that to the client. Well, the client has to send the subscribe out to the broker and the broker is somewhere, right? It's going to do something and eventually it's going to respond back with the ACK. And during that time, most of the libraries all the libraries that I could find block on my subscribe. That's not very friendly. I would like it actually to subscribe, um, to send the subscribe out and do something more like this. Send the subscribe out and just asynchronously let me know when you have completed the subscription. That's kind of how I, I want the system to work. In fact, most really well-written performing systems for embedded devices are devices that at least have the, the appearance of being event driven. They respond to events and they do things with events when they come back. Um, so it was blocking. Um, it lacked any form of dependency injection for most of the libraries. What I mean by that is you often already have a library that implements, let's say the TCP or TLS or some type of protocol that you need to use. You don't want to write that again and you don't want them using theirs. You want to provide, this is the communication system for you to use. Um, how about threading or the concept of executors, right? I, I, please use the one that I'm going to provide to you because if you abstract it far enough, it's just the main loop, right? You're just running a main loop. That's all the same thing. Um, and then event notification. Those were the really big things for us. All right, I'll give you a second for this one while I tie my shoe because it came untied. I don't want to trip. <laughs> So, uh, yeah. So, several people were nerd, si nerd sniped in the process of doing this. Uh, Kebalo, for one, and, um, and Yarun, who's actually uh, here at the conference this week. Um, and this is where, where they helped out. So, um, Augustine wrote a Java app for us. So on Android, and all it's going to do is communicate to this thing. So this is speaking Bluetooth um, light, and so it's low energy Bluetooth. And it's going to run the MQTT client, and through the Bluetooth connection, which is not a TCP connection, right? It's just something else. It's going to communicate to the phone, which is going to do nothing more than just pass that stuff onto the broker and back and forth. This is the part where we would have the demo, except that um, I'm having a problem. So I picked this board up from Sam last week. We want to thank NSYNC Labs also for letting me do that. So I stole it off the pick and place line as it was coming off, literally. 
uh, and they had one other and some C code that kind of brought the code up or the board up. And how many of you have done embedded work where you're trying to no OS and you're just trying to get something to run on a chip? Okay, good. So you know the challenge of just trying to get sometimes the linker script to do the right thing so that you, you don't lose your vector table for the interrupts and those things. And I think that's a currently where I am because I get like part of the board is running and the rest of the board's not. But this is what, we, what we're running on um, and the target at the moment. Um, it's a 32-bit ARM Cortex. Um, M0 is inside the core. It's got 128K of embedded flash and 32K of RAM. Now my target, um, this is that board sitting there, the target that I'm trying to target is a 32K um, for flash. So the text size is gonna be 32K. Um, and so if you've not done this type of thing before, this is the type of thing you do. You tell the linker like where stuff exists, right? So things like the text space, those things that you used to talk about in school and you probably haven't thought of since if you haven't done things like this, text and BSS and data, and all that, you've got to tell it like where they show up and the memory on the board. And we've got to think about those things as we're developing. Because when somebody talks about code bloat, that's what they're saying, right? They're saying that your text size is too large. That's what they're supposed to be saying. I think what they're saying is the debug size is too large, to be honest. But um, all right. So we want to be able to inject into our library um, a connection and an executor. So something that tells it, this is the concept of when you want to run something, you can queue it to be ran. And um, whether that's implemented on a main loop or it's implemented through some interrupt thing or a timer system, we don't care. It doesn't matter anymore to us. Um, we've got a lot of things going on, potentially at once, from the point of view of the client. It has the user possibly asking for a subscribe while at the same time it's sending up a publish. From the back end, the broker is possibly receiving a publish message and getting a, a, an act back. And then we've got timer type things that are coming in. So the system needs to do several things. And sometimes those, those events need to be chained together. So like, for example, establishing a connection, then negotiating with the broker, and then any of the subscriptions that have come in from the time of the life that we've started, we now need to send those subscriptions. But we can't send the subscriptions until we've actually established and negotiated with the broker, right? We've gotta, we've gotta make it to that point. So one way to answer this is you can say, oh, I'll just chain together completion handlers. Which, by the way, is a lot like just saying dot then in your futures, okay? That doesn't scale very well. It falls apart pretty fast when you have a lot of things going on because you're trying to maintain state of your system in this chain that you created you know, at, at some, some point. Don't, don't do that. So um, it could be because I'm a double E, but I think it's because it's the right solution. Hierarchical state machines answer these types of things and they give you this, this um, this tool that you can say it is right or not right away. You, you know um, whether you are handling the events you're supposed to, when you're supposed to, and um, that will be nice. So um, this is a kind of a miniature representation of what the hierarchical state machine looks like for this. Um, the connect broker, so this is the top machine, and the connect broker actually has a submachine in which some things happen, like we negotiate with the broker, when we do that, we're waiting then for the connection act. If we don't get it, there's a, a retry process that occurs. Um, these end up in error. Notice there's nothing that actually gets us out of this one. There's no connection here. And that's because um, from the connect broker, this transition occurs when that success happens in the, in the hierarchical scheme. Um, so we would like to use this instead. So, uh, wow, that was amazing. I have no idea what it did, but that was neat. See, there's gonna be code. All right. Um, so step one of getting this thing to work was to get the C code that I had to try to compile under C++. And that's, that's always the, like this constant challenge. Um, the, here, here's just a little snippet of some of the C code that we started with. And, and this code was written just to bring the board up, right? So it's in whatever state bring up the code looks like it's not meant for production or anything of that sort. So what they're doing is they've got this OLED that's on the board and right, they have, oh my goodness, can you even do that, right? We've got a series of bytes and we're going to cast that to this array of a temp type and pass it into this pointer thing. And you're like, okay, in C++ we don't like that. In fact, the compiler will tell you, right? We don't like that. 
That's really bad. And along the way, we had also passed in the number of bytes. And so we would look at this right away and we'd say, wow, that's not the answer, right? That, there are better ways to do this. So one way to do it right away is just say, all right, we've got this thing called an initializer list and I'm just gonna use it because that makes good sense. And now I've got a version here that takes an initializer list and really just forwards on to the version that had existed previously. Now there's this constant problem with C and C++ having to do with constness. And so here we're taking it as a const because we're trying to be friendly, but um, somewhere along the line, you're going to get to something that you're gonna have to just cast the const away in order to get into the CP C API. And that's just the way it is, right? You, you don't feel dirty at the end of the day or anything. You just, you write it at the very low level and then you're done. Um, so that's the const cast. So the code now, at least from the, the use, usage point, is a lot easier, right? I can just use initializer list. I don't have to worry about the size and getting those out of sync, pass them down. This didn't generate any extra code. So I have a cleaner API, and this produced no more code than I had before when I look at the text space. How much bigger did it grow? It didn't grow at all. Okay, and that's what we would expect, right? I think most of us in this room would expect the result of the compiler to do the right thing. And of course, it did the right thing. Um, so let's just take a baseline. Once we finally got the whole thing compiling, um, C99 versus C plus plus 14, we ended up with a bigger text size. And that is not surprising, by the way. Um, so at this point, we're kind of, all right, I can deal with that, that's all right. It's, it's not a whole lot larger, it's a little bit larger. Um, but what can we do about things like that? So the first thing um, is you go, well, can I just turn off uh, runtime type information? Because I'm not gonna ever use it. So let's try that. No, of course, I'm not using any of it. And so it was smart enough to not actually generate any of it into the text. But um, you know, the big one for me is this. I just turn off exceptions. Because the reality is on the, one of these embedded devices, what am I gonna do with an exception anyhow? I'm gonna enter in some place where I probably reboot the device, right? And there are other ways for me to catch, catch that and to reboot the device or whatever is appropriate for that device. Turning the exceptions off immediately saved me 5K. Now, I want you to put this in perspective. I'm trying to target 32K, that's a sixth of my memory. I got a sixth of my memory back simply by disabling exceptions. When people tell you that they, they disable exceptions in embedded devices, it's because it, exceptions used up more memory than I have in this device completely, right? So the ex, just the overhead of having exceptions on, not even using them, just having them turned on is just over 5K. I don't know. I figure I can do something else with that 5K. So I'm gonna leave them off. They're just, they're not that important to me. Um, now the other thing that I noticed was they were compiling with 0.3 um, initially in the make files. I'm like, oh, well, let's not do that because space is what I care about. I don't care about speed. I care about space. And so uh, OS right away. And now, check it out. I am now below the C C99 baseline. Now that was expected also because the optimizer is better. And so, um, I was hopeful that this would happen and this slide would be really cool. What I was not expecting is this now no longer runs. Now, I wasn't, I was only halfway not expecting it. This is very common in embedded things when you bring them up. Turning the optimizer on at different levels optimizes things away that sometimes you didn't think about. Like, you know, the vector table for your interrupts appears to not be used anymore which is why we have the word volatile. And there's some other little tricks that you sometimes have to play, including we just have to write it in assembly so that the thing doesn't go away. Um, so there's, this is why this demo isn't going to work at the moment. It's because there's some setup, something or another I haven't quite figured out yet. But um, 16 is not bad. That's the baseline of the original code that they had on here that was kind of doing some type of communication with a phone. Um, if we have just main, by itself, we have no overhead with no exceptions between 99 and C14. So 720 bytes, 
is what we're going to use up just for a blank main. That's good, it's a great place to start. We're like on even playing ground, right? So we like that. <clears throat> um, that is surprising that that's there. Oh, that's there because, so I decided, let's just give it a try. There's this thing called connect and it has like a client ID associated with it. Let's just make it a string. Why not? Let's go wild. In fact, yeah, we're gonna have a vector of things later, right? Let's just go wild. Why not? Why, why double guess the compiler off the bat? Just because everybody tells you you can't use it? Let's just try it, right? So adding string, um, we ended up with 364 bytes more inside of the text space. That's not horrible for um, you know, a variety of different uses. It might be if that tool does what I, what I need, and I can stay within my budget, I'm gonna just keep using string as opposed to writing my own something or another fancy view into the memory that I know is not gonna be going away, right? So at the moment, I'm not gonna worry about it. The other thing I'm not gonna worry about, I'm not gonna worry about this vector right now either. And the reason is because vector and string look like pretty normal interfaces that you're going to be able to write efficiently for an embedded system anyhow. The interface is fine. So at some point, if I have to swap those out for something else, there are all kinds of cool tricks that we can use to do that, and we'll do that later. But right now, I'm not gonna worry about it. So there we go, string. Um, so this is what the client's signature kind of looks like. Um, so things have been reduced a little bit to fit on slides and get rid of some of the cruft. But the client is going to be instantiated with a connection and an executor type. Um, these are the types that are going to handle the, the communication itself. It knows how to be given bytes to deliver and it knows how to asynchronously provide bytes back when there's something available. Um, and then this publish head, um, handler type is asynchronously the, the system, the, um, the library needs to provide topics that come in to the application when they come in, right? And so this is the handler that's going to, to take care of that. Now, initially I was like, oh, let's just use like std function, but I wasn't that daring. So uh, at the moment, it's just this type diff, which could be an std function or it could be a variety of other things. Um, and, and I think we'll talk about that also in a little bit. Um, okay, internally we have this client interface wrapper, um, the handler itself, I'm gonna hold on to my ID, and um, this thing is the state machine. So that's what we internally store, and we've got some constructor that takes these items by reference. Yes, Jeff? Change string types, or is that a type def? It is a type def at the moment, yes. Um, and maybe I'll just mention this right now about the type def thing. So, so very often at this point, I would have also passed in an allocator the allocator that I want to use for anything internally that I might want to need an allocator for. And I'm, I'm trying something new with this particular library, which is with um, template aliases, I'm able to do things that I couldn't do before. So that alias could represent something that has in it the allocator to be used already. Um, and before I couldn't do that, right? So I always had to pass the allocator in and around. Oh yeah, no, it's chosen, it's yeah. like this particular pool allocator at compile time. Yeah. So do you have a key function? Oh, that's a, so that's a good question. There's, uh, what do you mean by heap? No, no, there's no malloc. No, so, so there actually is an implementation for the library that came with the chip. Somebody was nice enough to have a malloc. Um, I haven't looked to see how it's implemented. When you do embedded though, you just have memory, right? If you wanted to, new stuff off, you, you're gonna have to go figure out how to take care of that. There are lightweight libraries that can be set up to do these things, but um, you, don't, you don't have memory management that, that doesn't exist. Yeah, that's, that's kind of the norm, right? Yeah, the norm is you don't have malloc, you don't have free, yeah. So what, by the way, yeah, um, the previous slide, the string thing, the reason that got me there on, the, on using string is I noticed in some code that was in the bring up code for the board, somebody had called malloc. I'm like, ha! Huh. <laughs> That's cool, I wonder if I can use string. <laughs> um, all right, and then there are some other things. We're gonna be able to connect, disconnect, subscribe. Um, 
huh, and unsubscribe. <laughs> Interesting. And then um, set the publish handler. We're going to be able to publish things. And um, we're not going to talk too much more about that because uh, we're going to run out of time. But let's look at the, uh, let's look at the constructor. So the constructor is kind of what you would expect, right? It needs to take these items and it needs, it needs to pass them off. And so the connection, the thing that's actually going to handle communicating bytes back and forth, and the thing that's going to handle the, the concept of executing things for me, those are passed in and they're given to this thing called the client interface. Um, I'm going to initialize the submachines and then I'm going to um, start the main, the main machine running. Um, all right, so who's used Boost MSM before? So MSM, I was hoping would like just be the amazing thing here. Um, and I'll just say it now, I, I love MSM. It is, it is a really, really great library. Um, it ended up with far more text space being used than I actually expected. Um, and so Christoph and I have been talking about some changes to make for like a 14 version. I know that there's another guy here at the conference this week who, who has done something with the embedded UML version of it, which is a little different than what I want to deal with. But if we want to make a state machine, um, we're going to do this little inheritance thing we'll talk about in a moment, but this gets us one half of it and we pair that up with this back end and now we have the state machine. Now what goes inside of it, notice it's just a struct, what goes inside of it, this is why I like state machines. I don't like the fancy UML whatever language. I want a state table. I want to know what the states are that I'm starting, what the event is that's going to cause it to move, where it's going to go, any action it might perform along the way, and if there's a guard condition associated with it. And I want to be able to look at that very quickly and know how it's going to perform. And MSM's great, right? It's got this, this ability through the meta pro programming magic to take type lists and create now the state machine for me out of this. It's, by the way, it's blazing fast. These are just crazy, crazy fast state machines. They're just a little more bloated than I'd like. It's not so bloated that we can't use it for this product though. So we're gonna get, it's gonna be small enough that this will work. So basic idea, right? I'm a not connected, I get an event that says connect, I move to the next state, connect broker. That's, that's how we read these, all right. So what do states look like? Well, the not connected state is nothing more than a struct. And it's inheriting from this thing called state. The, um, it has, can have on entry code and on exit code. So things that it's gonna perform as it comes into the state and things that it might do on the way out of the state. Um, so on the way into the state, I want to update the connection status with anybody that's interested in it that we are disconnected. So if we're coming into this, not connected, we're clearly disconnected, and I'd like to send that event out. Versus if I'm in the connected state, as I come in, I'm connected, but as I leave, I'm disconnecting. So I'm no longer connected, I must be doing something else, so I'm disconnecting. Again, this FSM, this lets me get to the state machine, which is that outer struct that we first had, that's that machine, that gets me a reference to that machine, and so I can put state full information in there, or functions I want to run, or other things, right? So that gets me there. Um, this little client we're gonna look at in a moment is a way for me to be able to pass some stuff back up. And then, how about shutting down? Well, while I'm shutting down, if I get other events coming in, like the connect event while I'm in the middle of shutting down, I wanna defer that. It's not that I just wanna drop it on the floor, it's an important event. And so I can just write with MSM, deferred events and give you, these are the list of all the events that might come in in this state that are deferred until it gets into the next state. Now this is a lot easier to write a state machine this way and to think about it than some of the other ways we write state machines. So if the answer is a state machine, which it probably should be for more things than it is showing up to be, <laughs> um, think about MSM. How about that send packet? What does it look like to do something like an event? Now, all these notes are just types because it is an MPL list. So these are all types that are being listed. Um, we've got distinguishing things between a publish out and a subscribe and an unsubscribe. So these are all overloaded for each of those. And it's calling client send. Again, send. And it's just kind of saying, oh, I don't know whatever the, just send it. 
So the machine itself is handling what can happen at any particular states. There's not a lot of, um, th there's no more business logic there, right? We just want to use the state machine to handle the state and what's allowed and not allowed, and then send that off to somewhere else to do the work. So let's talk about, oh, and, and, then, and then the one other thing we need inside of our Boost MSM machine, so all that other stuff there was in here, we need um, to tell it what the initial state is. When it comes in, what is the initial state? The initial state's gonna be not connected. And there's this other thing called submachines. What are sub-state machines that might exist? Now, um, when we were looking at the state table, we had this thing called uh, connect broker. But these are actually all the states that are describing there, and none of them say connect broker. So where does connect broker come from? Well, it's another machine itself. It's a whole sub-state machine. Remember we had on that first diagram, it was a submachine. So we're just listing that it's a submachine. Okay, so inside of the helpers, we've got nothing more than the transition table is an MPL vector. Submachines is this meta, meta list, which should freak you out a little bit. We have another one, but. Um, and then what is the base class, meta base? Well, it was apparent that it was gonna be some um, CRTP pattern because we had it being passed in again. So the derive is just being passed to the state machine def. And this is just kind of to make it easier to write because I don't like writing all the crud. But it has another thing which is there is often in a state machine some shared something or another between all the submachines. Like they all want to use the send method. They all need to use a timer. They all need to use something or another that has to do with the parent machine. If you think about the machine as being the machine and all the hierarchical ranges through it, there's something they all need to get back to. And um, this is a technique that we developed for Lauden um, and we use it a lot. And so in here, I have this client interface. Client interface pointer to client. So what is client interface? Um, so if you remember when we, were, when we were constructing our client initially, we were passing in the connection and we were passing in uh, the executor by reference into this thing um, and that was like hanging out. Well, it's still hanging out. It's gonna be uh, this type over here, this client interface wrapper. But the problem about the client interface wrapper is the client interface wrapper itself is, is decorated with whatever those types are, right? The type of the connection and the type of the executor are part of it. And what I might want to call back into the main class, which is the client itself. I can't do that without knowing what those types are. So what I need is a little bit of type erasure to help me out because I need to be able to store some interface that I can get to regardless of what else is going on. And so what we're going to do is just make our own type erasure in the cheap way. So just some virtual methods that take care of this is my interface itself. Um, and then I can add whatever I want. You know, I can still have template type whatever calls inside here. Um, in this case, somewhat pseudocode, though it does do something. <laughs> um, so if send got called on the client interface, which is what all of the submachines have, it will do something, it'll actually send to broker. Send to broker is going to be implemented though by something else. Well, what is it implemented by? This client interface wrapper that actually took the, the real connection executor. It's got references to those. And then now it can just forward off that information. So what we've done is we've separated the concrete type, the client interface wrapper, it's stuck inside of the client itself with its types decorated. And inside of all the submachines, we don't know the type and we can't actually get it in in any way. And so we're gonna use a type erased version and push that down. So the serialized method doesn't depend on the type of the... Right, yes. And that's the whole key is that all those methods don't depend upon the type of the connection or of the executor. Now it also does this real cool thing by not propagating types further down than I need them. There's this payoff between a jump table and how large that is and some additional um, text that we might end up using by having instantiations we didn't need. And so we kind of like 
weigh that off. But this is not why I'm doing it here. The reason I'm doing it here is because there's no way to get an MSM state machine constructed with these other types inside of it. It just can't know what they are ever. So um, we've got to have some way to separate them out. So this hierarchical finite state machine is hierarchical. So this machine needs to know about that stuff. And then this one also inherited it. And it needs to know about this, right? So there's got to be some way when these machines are coming up, these submachines are coming up, that that pointer is getting initialized in all of them. Well, how are we going to take care of that? So this is that initialized submachines it's getting called with the top machine and then the address to our client interface. And um, what is initialized submachines? Well, it's going to take the machine in the interface. It's going to take the machine dot client underscore and set that to the interface that got passed in, because that's what it is, right? Okay, so we got the pointer being set. Then we're going to do this initialized submachine impl. We're going to create an impl, and we're going to call descend on the machine and apply. The idea is that we want to descend on all the submachines that we can and apply this same technique and let it keep doing that. So initialized submachine is going to take in the reference and the pointer, and here we're going to, um, this is something that we get from, from MSM. So from the Metastate Machine library, we're able to actually query the submachine. If we give it a submachine type, we can actually get the pointer back for the submachine that's valid for this particular instantiation that we're in. So we're, we're trying to just get instantiations of machines. There's no way to, to, we don't have a variable to these, right? We don't have a name. We've got to somehow get them out. And this is how we're getting them out. And then we're going to just take the submachines and we're going to set its client also to the same interface, make another impl, reapply, right? So we're just taking and recursively reapplying through all the machines any submachines that they might have. Um, and then we're descending again. So what is, uh, what is descend? Well, descend is nothing more than um, a for each on the submachines. Now, where did these submachines come from? Remember, we had a, one of those meta, meta lists, whatever that was, as the submachines. And this was just like a type list of the submachines that existed. And then we have to terminate at some point. So uh, what is a meta list? And why do we need yet one more meta programming something list thing? Well, we needed it because I needed something interesting to do other than just writing an MQTT library. So, and I wasn't going to pull in MPL. So um, we can write meta lists, right? We can, write, we can write type lists simply by doing this now. Life is great. We, it, it's easy. And if I wanted to know the size, because that was one of the things I needed to know, if I needed to know the size, well, I could just use size of, right? for the parameter pack. Except that this is kind of ugly to write. So I don't want to use it that way. I just want to write size V, right? And with its type. So now I've got a little bit of decoration on it, but that's how we ended up using it. Size underscore V and then the type. And then that told me what the size of the list was. Great, great. Looks like we've written a lot of code, but um, it's all for a good reason. Now. How about for each? Because we had to write our own for each for some reason also. Well, what does for each look like? And the reason we wrote our own for each is because it's so easy to do that there was no reason to use somebody else's. So we take the list in. We're going to, we're going to instantiate one of these um, for eaches. Um, sorry, it's a, it's a function. And we're going to pass in a constructed version of the list. And then we're forwarding over whatever the function is that came in. What does this do? Well. Um, don't worry about the do nothing for a moment, but we're going to take the function and the type and comma zero, we won't worry about that either for a moment, dot, dot, dot. So the idea is we want to expand out the function call over and over again. Now, that's, I'm glad you asked about that. So um, the reason the zero there is there, by the way, is in case f returns a void type. That's not going to help me out a whole lot. So the zero works out to be just like a whole thing of ints. And notice I'm expanding this 
in this do nothing, which does nothing except for it gives me a place to make the expansion occur. So now there's just a question of, do you care about order? So if this is a function call, the order is not specified for a function. However, I am pretty certain, I was a lot more certain up to um, just a few moments ago when Steven asked <laughs> that, Uh, it ha does it have to be braced? It, I thought it was just, it's not just constructor? I'm pretty sure it's syntactically based on the braces. Okay, so I gotta look that it up might, now. It's possible, but I don't remember. There might be two characters on this slide that are wrong. <laughs> it's possible. Okay. So the whole idea of all of this exercise was so that I can do this for each and to send down with a type and run some function on the next type, right? And you're like, holy moly, Michael, that was, that was insane. So if we just had the parent and no substates at all, this cost me nothing at all, nothing, zero, compared to just like setting it and not setting it. The, the compiler, because it's in the constructor still, the compiler is going to optimize that away. It can kind of understand that you set the variable twice the first time it didn't matter. So everything's all right there. And if I had to descend down into children, my text size went up 28 bytes. So I think all of that extra bit of code, which, you know, why the complexity of all that other stuff? The reason that we have the complexity of the other stuff is because I don't want to think about it. I just want to write, I have submachines in my state machine. And I want the initialization to work properly all the time. Not only that, I don't have a way in MSM to get in there and get to those machines. There's like, there's no way to do it. So I, I had to go through some trick to do this. So I think what we should think about is, one of, the, one of the comments from the Twitter feed, right, was those CS people with all their levels of abstraction and templates creating code bloat. So my code bloat was 28 bytes which at the moment, I don't care about 28 bytes. I'm, I'm, I'm doing okay with 28 bytes. And the abstraction was a whole lot better. I love this, by the way. I like writing that. It makes me happy every time I write that because I used to do other stupid stuff that wasn't as, as pretty. And I'm like, oh man, I could just like, I could have this other thing that does all the work for me. All right, so I don't see any code bloat. I see nice abstraction. Um, so let's just keep going with types. Types are cool. Let's make the QS levels um, enumerated classes. And let's make types for the bidirectional types are publish or bidirectional messages. Pubback is a, a bidirectional message. Um, uses publish whether I'm sending the message or I'm receiving the topic update. Bo both are called publish. Or it's the same message both ways. So publish has some things in it. It's got this dupe. QoS, retain, topic name, packet ID, and a payload. Um, and again, I'm not gonna worry about this right now. This could become something that's a lot more efficient later and that's fine if, if needed. The reason that this is not efficient possibly is because of malloc. And I may not have one, right? I might have a pool allocator that I just got done writing you know, last night type thing. So um, th this just might have to change because of um, the inability to use vector but the interface is going to be the same. Whether I'm using vector or my own thing, there's no reason to change the interface. It will look fine. Um, Pubback only has the ID in it. And then we've got some more. Um, there's conac, subac, unsubac, and ping response, which has nothing in it, but it's just a type. Okay, and then if we say, what are all the messages that we can receive coming in, the control messages, let's just, make a variant of those, because I personally love variants. So I might as well just make a variant of it. And what's the cost of a variant? Well, end up the cost of a variant for this, and I don't remember, but the text size was like really small and it didn't bother me at all. I'm like, okay, that's cool. We'll just, we'll use that. Um, I'm using X3's version of variant, because it allows me to make this a type as opposed to a type def of something. So, um, Okay, and now we've made, yes, sir. What do you mean by that you can make a type without type that? Can you do the same exact thing you're using boost variant? So with boost variant, I have a type def of a thing. Well, and you could inherit from boost variant, but you have a type. Um, I could inherit from that, correct. 
Now, it ends up that I, don't, I guess I don't need to use the, um, any of the X3 bits. I guess I'm used to typing it. So normally we end up using X3 variants if we need to forward declare because we have a recursive AST or some recursive data structure. Then I can't refer to, in this case, the control packet internally into the variant or something of the variant. So if you had like a map of control packets or a vector of control packets and it was like this, this weird thing, then you have to use a recursive variant. Um, or if you can make it a real type, you could forward declare control packet and then just use that. You can't do it with boost variant unless you use uh, the recursive parts of, of it, which makes a pointer. Yeah, because it's just, there, it's a nothing. It's not a, we'll, we'll take this offline though. Okay, yeah. Sorry, what is X3? I'm sorry, X3 is a spirit version. Yet one more spirit version. And so if you've got this far in the process, you might as well adapt all of them, right? <laughs> okay, so those who don't know what fusion adaption is, it basically is, is going to create some stuff that allows us to um, treat struct types as um, tuples that are references to the members, for lack of a better way to, to explain it. And, it's, and it allows us to query some information via meta programming. Um, and you know, once you've already gone to this extent, then you might as well ask the question, well, I wonder if. So first of all, uh, what did the, what, there's like lots of ways to parse the data stream that's coming in, right? It's just a bunch of bytes coming in. So you could say, well, you know, am I working on the header byte or am I working on the length? The length inside this thing is, um, it's one of these wacky lengths when the MSB is set, the lower seven bits keep accumulating until the MSB is not set and then, right, so it's run, whatever they call that. It's an encoded length. Um, and then the rest of it's the body that is associated with that length. Um, so we could be parsing like that, and then we could say, um, hey, it was like reader, read header. Well, what does read header look like? Well, may, I don't know, maybe it looks like this. I get the front out, and then I pop it, and then, um, then I say that I'm now doing the length, so now I fall out, and now I'm in the length. Um, and then eventually I, I've got something that I've read in, and now I'm trying to figure out based upon the header bit, whether or not it's a publish or what type of thing it is, and then I can call another method. And this is kind of what it looks like when it was written in C and some version of C++ also, right? Um, here's the, this is just sub ACK. So this is all it's trying to do is figure out, it, it, it needs to get the packet ID, so it's 16 bits coming in, and then it needs to get a list of however many QO, QoS levels are for the acknowledgement that came back. So if you subscribe to like 12 things, you're gonna get 12 QoS levels in the order of the subscriptions and they relate to that. Um, so now we gotta get all those back. Well, th this, is, this is ugly. Or, I mean, what would it look like if we wrote this in Boost Spirit? Just for the fun of it, right? This was actually an experiment for Michael to write it down and say, Joel, you need to go, you need to go fix Boost Spirit. It isn't going to fit on my embedded device. By the way, I've tried this on V2 and it didn't work at all on my embedded device. So I thought, well, let's try it with X3. Um, so these are the byte representations of, um, that tells us what type it is. So it's a acknowledge publish acknowledgement, a publish, conac, whatever it is. That's that first bit that we read in. And how we read spirit grammars is it's saying, it's this or that or that or that or that or that that we're parsing, right? It's one of those things. And we read this as it is this byte followed by the pub ack, whatever that is. Here's a byte followed by sub ack. So what is sub ack? Well, sub ack is, um, well, there's this encoded length, but I'm going to just say skip the encoded length. I don't care what it is. So skip that, read in a big word, and then Read in zero or more QoS things. Well, what is a QoS thing? Well, a QoS thing is one of these bytes, and remember I made it a, which was a bad idea, I made it an enumerated class, which means I can't just like shove some number in there. It kind of stinks. 
Except then I woke up and said, you know, actually that's kind of good because it's not just any number. It's got to be one of these things. So if it's that, it's a QoS level zero or one or two, and then there's a failure set up too. If it's that, then it was a failure to get a QoS. So, okay, this has a good mapping. In fact, this grammar, right, is written in such a way that if this fails, if it's not one of those, I'm gonna get an error along the way. All these little things that Spirit's been doing for me, I'm gonna, I'm gonna get errors if things don't parse properly. Whereas the other parser thing that I wrote, not so much. I was just kinda like, yeah, looks good. Just keep going. Here's the rest of them. Um, all pretty easy to read if you've done any Spirit before. If not, Spirit is just an embedded um, domain language and um, for parsing, right? And so you can kind of squint your eyes and say, oh, this kind of looks like, you know, something that I might have seen for grammar stuff before. And um, this was the amazing part. The entire grammar, uh, there's one more set, which is for publish, which by the way, was not easy to write. So the published grammar was super, super hard. It would have been trivial to write in, in V2 of Spirit. And in X3, it got to the point that I just wrote a custom parser as opposed to writing, they have ways to write custom plugin parsers. I just wrote that because I, like, I couldn't sort it out. Um, and so actually, I couldn't sort it out, so I asked Joel to help me last night. He says, uh, I don't know. <laughs> he says, in V2, that would have been trivial. I said, yeah. <laughs> in V2, it would have been trivial. But I paid just barely over 3K for this. I mean, just a few bytes over 3K for readability. And I thought this was going to be just like huge. There was no way text space wise it was possibly going to fit. Um, so the way I'm looking at it right now, I traded exception handling for um, a spirit grammar and some other things. I don't know what yet, but some other stuff. That's a great trade. So I'm keeping my spirit grammar. All right, templates are not evil. Probably don't need to tell this group that, but they're not. And don't try to be smarter than your compiler. So one of the things that I decided to do in this experiment of creating this library was not the stuff that I would normally do. I, I, I mean, assume there was some of that. I've been doing embedded development for a long time. And so there's kind of that background of things I probably just avoid without trying to avoid them, without knowing that I'm avoiding them. But I'm also just trying to do things that I wouldn't have normally done. Um, and just see what happens, right? Compilers are so much better than they used to be. Maybe it'll all work out great. Uh, this, is, this is an example of what I mean by don't try to be smarter than your compiler. So when we need to serialize something, and, and I, you know, this code is more just for serving a purpose of, of explanation. Don't do this at home. When we need to serialize something, there's some things we need to do. The first thing we need to do is we have to figure out what the variable length of the packet is going to be when we serialize it. Um, so there's some variable size based upon the QoS level and all kinds of other crazy things. And based upon that, then that's the number of bytes that we're going to need. Um, so the variable size plus um, the header byte and then the actual length for encoding the variable size is gonna give me my packet size. So the packet size um, once I have the packet size, I need to get a buffer that can represent the packet size that I can work with. There's lots of ways I could have done this differently, by the way, that this is, don't do this. <laughs> and then there's gonna be some implementation of actually doing the serialization, converting the struct into those bytes. Now these steps have to occur regardless of what struct I'm trying to actually send out. It might be though, sometimes I know some very specific things. You know, if I was a, if I was hanging out with a bunch of C coders, one of you would say, yeah, but some of those structs, I know the length is not variable length encoded. They're always two bytes, that's it, they're two bytes. There's never gonna be anything else. I'm like, yeah, whatever. These are the steps, right? And I'm not gonna double guess the compiler, I'm gonna assume it can do its job and optimize this. So what does the implementation look like for a serialize? Well, this is the one for subscribe and it needs to set the header, the control header byte. Um, it needs to figure out what the encoded length is. It needs to encode the packet ID into the right format. Um, and then for every topic, it needs to go ahead and send out, it needs to encode the string inside of a uh, length encoded string format. 
and then the QoS goes behind it for each of those. Okay, it does that and then it's done. Now this, this work had to happen for that subscribe. That's the work that has to happen for that, right? Um, how about if we were to do um, a ping request? Well, notice one of the things was this get variable length, right? Which needs to calculate length. Except that for a ping request, the length, variable length is zero. There's no variable length at all. So let's just make it a const expression, zero. And then what does this look like? Uh, that. Now, I'm pretty certain that the compiler is going to do the right thing for me. I had the same algorithm, so to speak, of the things that have to happen. And the other one, it had to use all of that. It had to figure out, this is the, like a real length for the, the packet that's gonna be encoded. And this, I've got some work I've gotta do. This one, um, okay, at compile time, I can determine that is zero. That looks like easy math to do for the compiler. I bet I can figure that out. And so now packet size, it knows packet size at compile time. Um, so I still have to get a packet to stick it into. And this ends up being just that. That's gonna get inlined as a copy of two bytes into that iterator. Depending upon what that thing is, that's all gonna happen at compile time, right? Packet size. Oh, yes. However, if I wanted a constant expert, yes. However, but what do you think the chances are if I said uint 16t packet size equals zero? That it will figure out that by the time it gets done with this, for this instantiation of a serialized, that all that stuff just goes away. But like really high. Yeah, it, there won't be any code. In fact, there wasn't any, which was why it was cool. So the thing that people complain about often when they're talking about templates is they complain about, I have to, I'm gonna get a new version for every one of these, right? I, I'm going to instantiate these for each of the types, I'm gonna get a new one. Tons, and, tons of these possibly, who knows how many? Well, we only have so many messages, so we're only gonna get so many. But I'm gonna get them here, I'm gonna get it here because this was like some weird thing going on. I'm gonna get a couple of them. Well, guess what? Your other option was to write the code for each of those individually. And so really what you're trading off, if, you, if you're talking about this for explosion, right? What you're trading off is, can the compiler optimize this? Is it gonna be able to do that as well? Can I give it enough information? Or, or is it going to fail and I'm gonna have like useless work that I didn't need to do for this situation? And if I have like useless work, then yeah, I'm gonna be upset, right? But if it works out that it will optimize it away, I don't care because now I've got like a single algorithm that I wrote. So what you don't want to do is you don't want explosions and types in which you've actually instantiated things you don't care about. You want to use it in the algorithms in which in essence it's a code generator for you. We think about like const expert probably more places I probably could have used it, right? Except that now I've got a, well, I've got some other potential problems because they're not all const expert. Um, my initial um, response to writing this was, you know, the whole, let's just write template metaprogramming stuff the old style way, you know, three, because, you know, that's what I've been doing forever. Um, okay, so the code for this, when it was generated, looked great. Right? So, and the other one looked like it had stuff in it like it was supposed to do, right? And I didn't end up with some weird thing where, um, everything had some large function, which is what I would have been concerned about. Um, okay, conclusions. Templates are not evil, you already knew that, but they're not. Okay, this is the other takeaway, I would say. Know what you're doing with templates. So don't, if you think about templates as, you can think about them two different ways. If you're writing metaprograms, you think about templates as pattern matching, or at least I think about templates as this pattern matching mechanism. Um, but if I'm using templates like this, I'm thinking about them as code generators. And I gotta think about, am I generating code that I don't want to have generated? Is this like something that I wouldn't have written by hand or is it helping me so I write less by hand, right? That is, in the embedded world, you really wanna be thinking about those things because you know, every few bytes actually do count. Uh, determine your level of embedded. All right, so I gave you the example of these two. 
you know, this one has a Cortex M0 in it. This is a beefy processor. It's, it's laughable, right, that this is embedded. Um, it also had a fair amount of memory on it. There are a lot of things I can do with this. I, I'm not going to get the stuff to fit on that other board, ever. And I'm not even gonna try, right? That's just kind of, that's at the level of embedded that um, doesn't even make sense. Um, so know what level of embedded you're dealing with and go for it. And start to use the standard containers. Um, it, it's a good place to begin. Um, the standard containers have decent interfaces, and so if nothing else, at, at the end, when you replace the container, you already have a bunch of code that's just going to work, and now you're only worrying about your, why your container didn't work, why your pool allocator wasn't quite right, or whatever it happens to be. Um, and then don't try to outthink your compiler. Um, so on this particular library, what's left? Um, so, I need to decide on a memory and container strategy. And so the, the, versions, the version that we wrote in December runs on cell phones and it's almost like having infinite memory it seems. Um, and there's a lot that has to happen with that particular thing that I think could happen outside of a smaller library that could be targeted for lots of you know, smaller devices. Like for example, um, if you subscribe to a bunch of topics with a broker and then you lose your connection and then you connect again later, you're, you're still subscribed it, as long as you don't say that you want a new session. Um, as a client using that library, is it reasonable to be able to ask what were my subscriptions? What were the things that had actually been act back later? And so one of the requirements in, in the project we did in December was they wanted to be able to ask at any particular time, what am I subscribed to? What are the filters that I'm subscribed to? So I've got to keep that around somehow, right? Well, that doesn't seem reasonable for a small embedded device to need to worry about that. That maybe could be built onto another layer. So that's one of the things I've got to worry, out, worry about. Extension points, um, I want, as most of our libraries, I want people to be able to use whatever type you already have and then that be adapted to whatever the library needs internally so that reduces the amount of copying that um, has to happen. Uh, there needs to be documentation, case studies. Uh, so I've done two now, where I took the interface that we kind of created and the board that I picked up from the NSYNC guys, and I said, okay, give me your code, and they already had code working with Bluetooth, right? They've already got this app running on a phone. How hard would it be to remove your protocol out and just put this protocol in? Is this like horrible or is it easy, easy? And it actually wasn't that hard to take, in fact, what they already had for their concept of this communication device, how we were gonna communicate to things, and um, adapt that by just writing two methods that called their two methods, or, you know, or received, shuttled basically back and forth, right? So that was easy. Um, and then they were using a, a timer loop, which is not unusual, um, and the timer loop fits right in with the concept of, of what thing to run next. And so that just fit right into the executor. So um, that one worked fine. And the other one I had actually, I wrote the code for it, so I already knew it was going to work on that because that was part of my model of how people should write code, of course. Um, and then testing needs to happen. And a name, because all good projects have names, because if you don't have a good name, you can't make a good t-shirt. I mean, that's really kind of how it boils down, right? Look, there's a Boostash shirt. Oh, man. <laughs> I love it. So, <laughs> I like macchiatos, which is, you know, like espresso, just the smallest amount of foam on the top, right? Just barely there, just marked. So, you could spell macchiato with a Q and two Ts, and I think you're doing pretty good. <laughs> I don't know. I'll get your suggestions of what what is a good name, and, um, and then maybe you know, uh, I'll trade you a t-shirt for a good name, because I have a couple more t-shirts. <laughs> All right, any questions? <laughs> yes? What compiler are you using? Yeah, um, ARM compiler GCC 5.1. So now it's running C++ 14? Yes, in dash 14 mode. Yes. Oh. Um, I didn't even consider it. I don't even know where I put it. Oh, there it is. There we go. That's basically saying uh, ARM GCC for something that has no OS. Yeah. Um, 
so you used a lot of like advanced C++ techniques in development of this, and putting things like Spirit and Fusion and those kind of things. Yeah. Did you consider what the implications would be on maintainability by non-C++ experts for this piece of code? That's a good question. So the, qu the question is, is um, considering maintainability of of the code base for non-C++ experts when using advanced constructs? Um, so the, the short answer is I didn't consider it for this library, but it's something we have to consider a lot. And um, I'll tell you my, my belief on it is that the user's interface, how a user interacts with something should be elegant um, and, and as clean as possible. And I like to usually approach an interface and just think about how I would want to use something and never think about how I would have to implement that and if it's even possible. Just, this is how I, I think it should be used. Um, and sometimes that then requires some weirdness in the back end in order to make it happen. Um, I think, probably should not say this on film, but I'm going to say it anyhow. I think <laughs> that there, are, there really are multiple levels and layers of programmers, just like there are of any skill level and anything that you do. Application programmers understand domains and they should stick with the domain and understanding the domain and writing applications well. And, and that's where the value comes for a company and that's how they make money. But there should be another group that probably writes libraries so the application developers could be proficient at their jobs. And their job is understanding how to write libraries that are very elegant and work well so the application developers can do what they want. And, and I think that's a different skill set. That's my, my belief. So yeah, is this maintainable by other people? Probably not, right? Yeah, people here. And maybe in that, in that other room too, right? But <laughs> so um, yeah, we're all here in Aspen right now. All right, any, any other hard questions? Or I'll take softballs too. I didn't use the word functor on purpose. <laughs> Do I know what's wrong? I don't really know what's wrong with my board yet. I, I know the hardware works. So it, I'm pretty certain something is just getting optimized out and not, um, yeah. I, uh, yeah. There, so there are all kinds of things to help me with the little board, but I don't have, um, so, Right before I got on the plane, this actually arrived in the mail. I was so happy. This is the developer kit for it. The most important part was it had a JTAG connection on it so I could actually program that. <laughs> <laughs> but, but I haven't even gotten it to work. Yeah. How much extra time at TSA did you spend? I didn't spend any extra time at TSA. They don't seem to care about this stuff. No. They care about other things, but not that. <laughs> Yeah. Yeah. So Jeff just was mentioning that um, various NASA projects over the years have used it. Um, so I, I think I will comment on something else that you, in essence, you brought up and maybe didn't mean to about the maintainability. Um, I think, you know, in my line of work, I see a lot of C++ code written by a lot of different people and, and get to teach people too about C++. And, and still the prevalent way to write C++ is what we might call like C with classes or very OO style. Looks like Java, but it's C++ syntax. Um, those, for lots of reasons, are non-starters, non right? I, I think generally speaking, it's not the right way to write code. Um, but it also has the tendency to be very bloaty and use tons and tons of space. 
And so those techniques just in themselves are very heavy. And, um, and I think personally just don't provide what you really are trying to, trying to get out of a good system. I just remembered as well, in the decade ago one, they did use STL. So again, I think the evidence is clear, right? The, the perception is incorrect yeah. about the amount of memory and whatever, whatever templates necessarily cause you to have. Now, obviously there must be some use cases in compilers and whatever that cause this to happen. Clearly I was trying to, yeah. but you know, it just seems like uh, overall the perception is wrong. Yeah, I think I, I definitely agree with that. And I, the, the other thing that when people talk about large things, I mean, Sebastian yesterday was talking about these huge things that he had because of template explosion. He, he's talking about um, the debug output version of something, right? Which I think we've all, probably all experienced. And so once those symbol names have been recursively added to the, you know, millionth node or whatever it is, you've just got these names that are enormous, sure, but they're not going to make it to the end because you're going to strip them out. Um, and, and so text size is something really different. Yeah, you, you couldn't link on your Microsoft compiler because it gave up and couldn't, couldn't finish, right? And that happens. But uh, the reality is, is that uh, when you're making a non-debug version, you shouldn't have these problems on an embedded device. Okay, so this comment from Jens is that uh, SpaceX is running C++ on their devices. It's starting to sound like one of those recovery, or it's, it's okay, we can run C++, it's good. <laughs> All right, any other questions? I never want to load the debug version onto my target, uh, myself. Um, so I will debug it on something else and have fairly good confidence and then it still won't work when it hits the hardware, right? But then, but then you, have, um, you have different ways to break when address points hit. You know, you, there's plenty of equipment that attaches into your, your system and the neat tricks they play so they, they remove an instruction and they put a break instruction in at that spot. So when it hits it, then the JTAG thing gets notified or the whatever you have for your particular processor gets notified. Um, and then so you're stepping through. And Processors support this type of thing, um, but it's typically not a debug version that you're putting onto the processor. So you prototype off hardware? Yeah. Yep, and then um, when I can, so um, hardware will also integrate to something else, right? So make bridges so I can just make sure that all the hardware works and the interfaces work properly and that's fine. So we're, we're not dealing with the Big Bang, all this stuff together, not working together. Um, the people who tend to write C for these things put the debug version on the controller? I don't know. <laughs> I, I write C still, I don't put the debug version on the controller. Speaking about embedded systems, does anybody measure the power consumption of different containers? Oh, power consumption of different containers? I don't know. Um, I'm, I don't know, but I'm sure somebody has. And the reason is because power for phones, right? Power is everything. Like, I think the current line of thinking is you, get, you burst as much as you possibly can now and get everybody hot doing something and then you put them all down again, right? Turn them all off. As opposed to like gradually working on things slowly. <laughs> I've run two papers on different languages but not in C++. Yeah, I'm not sure. Anything else? I'll leave you with my final slide then. This is like the teaser slide. Oh, no, that one's not the teaser slide. What is that? As soon as we get a name, I'll put it in the Kira Labs GitHub repository, but I don't want to just like put a name up there. I don't have a name. <laughs> yeah. 
I'm sorry, what? Uh, what's it called? MQTT? So MQTT? Tiny. Oh, tiny? tiny? Oh, I think I think some of the C guys would bulk. <laughs> yeah, that would cause fights. I don't, I don't want to be on Reddit, actually. <laughs> 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 All right, thank you very much for your time.